The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Romans 7, 14 through 25. Listen for the word of God. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not want to do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it, it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. The lesson from the Old Testament from this morning is found in Psalm 1 on page 380 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose, but whose delight it is in the law of the Lord and who mediates on this law day and night. The person that is like a tree planted by a stream of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The word of God for the people of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Help us to seek after you in a world in which we run after so many things, in a world in which so many things vie for our attention. 
Focus our hearts and our minds on you, to delight in you, to rejoice in your law. And right now, prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. It's no secret that I was an English teacher. One of my favorite poets was not in my favorite area to teach. I love teaching British literature. I hate American literature. It's out there. It's all right. Uh, Jan, I'm sorry. I strongly dislike American literature. So we had a conversation about that right before the service. So I strongly dislike American literature. With a notable exception, I love the work of Emily Dickinson. I love reading her poems. I love uh, uh, teaching her poems. And perhaps it's because they're very, very short. The one that I'm going to share with you is eight lines. And so it kept my attention very, very well. That's, that's about where my attention span is. And one of my favorite poems from Emily Dickinson is the one numbered 1263, which is remarkable in and of itself that she wrote 1,200 poems, and this is 63 past that. And it reads, tell all the, str tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Fantastic poem, and one that I think resonates with the scriptures. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much, is because 3,000 years before Emily Dickinson wrote this, God was putting poetry onto the lips of his people. Dickinson says that, that we can't uh, understand sometimes the truth straight on, and that's true. Some of us enjoy the directness of Paul when we read the scriptures. Some of us enjoy the fact that it's, it's just laid out there. Paul pulls no punches, although it may be as, as, uh, poor, uh, uh, as poor Steve had to file through that, I do not do what I want to do, but what I want to do I don't it's direct, it, even if it's confusing, and we can like that. We might like the, the other letters. We might like the letter of James, the directness there where James says, you believe there's one God? Good, even the demons believe that. It's direct. It's, it's very easy to interpret. Some of us like the narratives more. Some of us enjoy going through the stories of Jesus, the Gospels. Some of us enjoy going through Luke's part two, the book of Acts. Some of us like the histories in the Old Testament to see the, the, the way in which the story of God unfolds on the page. We like the narrative. We like the stories. We like following the near soap opera script of Joseph of Jacob, Isaac. But some of us resonate, just as we did in high school, a bit with poetry, and some of you are going, oh no. Because poetry wasn't your strongest area, but throughout Scripture we have this, this number of ways that God reveals his truth to us, the number of ways in which he spoke through the prophets and in which he spoke through the writers of the New and the Old Testament. And this summer, we come to a series called the, the Summer of Wisdom and Poetry. We're going to be looking at Psalms and Proverbs this summer. And the ways in which God speaks truth through the wisdom sayings and through the poetry. Largely lit, written by David, but written in other ways. Psalm is a funny word. All of us went through elementary school and put the P on front of, in front of it for good fun. We talked about the Psalms. But we, do we have an understanding of what a psalm is? I think we get an understanding that it's poetry. But when we look at the psalms and when we look at the words that are used for the psalms, one word really boils down 
the 150 books, the 150 chapters, excuse me, of Psalms, praises. At the heart of the Psalms is praise to God. It's worship. And for centuries upon centuries upon centuries, the Psalms have shaped the prayer and the devotional life of the church. In fact, the Psalms were, were so important. I was sharing with, with Mike as I was preparing a bit for, for uh, this, uh, the week prior to last, that the Psalms, the Psalter, as it's called, when you go from chapter 1 to chapter 150, was actually required for ordination in the early church. By 700 AD, in order to hold any ecclesiastical office, you had to know the Psalms perfectly. Elders, take note of this. Deacons, take note of this. But it shaped the worship and the devotional life of the church. And my hope is, as we go through this series, we find our own worship and devotional life shaped. From the very beginning here in Psalm 1, because Psalm 1 has to do with that very subject of our devotional and our meditative life. It's not too hard to see. Some of the aspects of the Psalms are very easy to understand. Here we have Psalm 1, which is a psalm about strength and stability that comes through God's Word, through knowing God's Word, but a bit more than that, and we'll get to there. The opening of Psalm 1 begins with a comparison, a very, uh, a very large comparison, and it may seem a bit confusing at times. But it starts out, blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But that person's delight is in the law of the Lord and on God's law they meditate day and night. That opening comparison, the first part of it is broken down into three different areas and, and it functions as a single unit. We have different phrases, expressions, we call them idioms. And perhaps sometimes we feel like an idiom but we, it's an idiom, it's an expression that gives us an understanding. One of the ones that Dale uses with me is from Genesis to Revelation. Don't, you don't have to go from Genesis to Revelation all in one sermon. <laughs> we talk about the whole nine yards, which of course was a military term for loading ammunition and how much ammunition was being carried. And that expression has come to mean everything. We have different idioms that express different concepts. And here, the psalmist uses a series of three idioms to express to us the range of ways that we can stray from God's Word. Uh, we can get confused by the beginning. A lot of translations start off with, blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. And as I do occasionally, I encourage you to take out your pencil and mark through a word in your Bible to help you understand it a bit. And here I'm going to do that again because blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the way of the ungodly. Wicked, we, we read that and we say, well, I'm, I, I may not be perfect, but I'm not wicked. At least, not until I meet a Cubs fan, at least. <laughs> but we look at ourselves and we say, I'm not wicked, I'm not this. And what the, the psalmist is going to do is increase the language from line to line. Blessed is the person who doesn't walk along in the counsel of the ungodly. Those who simply don't acknowledge God's existence. Not necessarily wickedness outward evilness, but just simply people who, no, I'm sorry, religion just isn't for me. 
And so when we understand that, we start to build the idiom, who, who walks in the paths of the ungodly, who, who, who stops in the counsel, who stops in the counsel uh, of sinners a bit more, and who sits in the seat of mockers, those who outwardly condemn and rail against the faith. And what the psalmist is expressing here is the entire range of positions from simple denial to outright, to outright contempt for the faith that can be. So blessed is the person who doesn't walk in that way but who, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on God's law, this person meditates day and night. Once again, we see an idiom there that we, that we can get tripped up by because many of us may read that and go, oh mercy, day and right, night reading the Bible? I have enough trouble getting through the liturgy. Let alone cracking the Bible twice a day. And here we have the expression for all the time. We've talked about it before. I'm always working on my house. We know that at a little literal level that's not true because I'm here. I'm doing this. I always have this going on. There's always family around. We use expressions to convey how entirely something is is in our lives. And here, that expression, day and night, is to, to express that which Paul says, which pray continuously, pray without ceasing, to express that depth in which God's law is in our hearts. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Continuously, it's always on our minds. And so the opening provides a comparison between these courses of light, of life apart from God's law, and the course which delights in it. And of course, we need to not forget that word, delight in God's law. Not simply compliance, because after all, we can comply with the law. We can comply with the speed limit, not because we enjoy it, but because we know that there is a cop sitting at the, old, uh, at the old grocery store on 24th Street, and we don't want a ticket. We can comply with the, the stop sign, not because we want to, because we've got somewhere to go, but because we see another car coming, and it's advantageous to our position. This is delight in God's law. Enjoyment, understanding that God's law brings life. An enjoyment to come and to read and to understand God's revelation. And so this delight is something that, that is from within us. Something that helps us win that meditation day and night because we want to. You know, it's funny, uh, we were, when we were down in Chavis this past week, uh, we had our assignments, but we made time because we were in Chavis two years ago. And we made time to go down and visit one of the residents that we helped two years ago. Miss Lily, Lily Niece. She is a force of nature. When we got there two years ago, the staff warned us. They said, now she's a bit fiery, so just be warned. And we fell in love with her. Because she is, but there is such an exuberance in Miss Lily for God and for God's word. As we were sitting there talking with her, one of the things that she said is, is to, was humbling to me in that she was telling uh, the Stockdale family, listen to his preaching. I believe that, that what he says comes from God's word. And any time you, you're not sure, go back to God's word and check it. Go and read it. Don't be afraid to approach it 
any time there's confusion. There is no doubt in my mind that Miss Lily delights in God's law. Over and over she sings the praises of God's provision in her life. A woman whose husband has been taken from her, whose home was falling down around her, and yet she says, praise the Lord. Because I get up in the morning and every step I take, he provides for me. Delight in God and God's law. She understands that those things of God will endure. They're like a tree planted by an irrigation ditch which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither. We're embarking on the, the summer time. We're embarking on that heat and humidity that is just energy sapping. And yet the image here is of a tree planted by streams of water that as the humidity is 4,000% and it's 400 degrees outside with a heat index of 500, the leaf doesn't wither. It stands strong in the circumstances, in the elements. It's planted by that stream. And so we see this beautiful image of the Word of God in our lives and what it does. It's that stream that provides the nourishment, whatever is going on outside of us. It's not a health and wealth psalm. Make that clear. It's not saying that if, if you just delight in God's law, you're going to have a Lamborghini in your, in your driveway tomorrow. You'll have a raise. Your teeth will be whiter. You'll be an inch taller and 40 pounds thinner. That's not what this psalm is saying. Because we can read that. Whatever he does prospers and we think, come on. But that which is done is built in an eternal sense. It endures no matter what the circumstances are outside of it. But then the psalmist moves, and the second half of the psalm highlights the temporary nature of life and works apart from God's law. Not so with the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Those things that we build outside of God's law, outside of God's will, have a temporary value, value to them. One of the things that I have uh, considered and, and reflected on as, I, I, as I've worked is television and radio shows. It's funny, we get very, very wrapped up in them. Uh, and during the mission trip, there was a lot of discussion of different television shows. I still like radio shows. I still love car talk, even though it's reruns. I love the Prairie Home Companion. And yet, we, we love these things, don't we? We can rattle off television shows from, for seasons and wait with anticipation for what comes next. We get sucked into the narratives. We cry when characters die. We curse the writers. And yet, it's not real. They're characters. The stories aren't real. They're, they may be modeled on something of reality, but they're, they're a shadow of what happens. Watch Grey's Anatomy. How many traumas can you have in one town? <laughs> but we hype ourselves up with stories that are of no content, no real content. And yet, when it comes to God's law and when it comes to immersing ourselves on those things of eternal value, we can get to the point where we, where we say, well, it's just not my thing. I don't enjoy it. I have trouble understanding it. But we will immerse ourselves in those unreal stories. We'll allow our emotions to be caught up 
in characters that aren't real? How are we spending our time? What are we building? Do we delight in God's law? And, and let me clarify, this is not forcing the scriptures on others. This is, this is about an internal disposition towards God's word in our own lives. Where do we stand with that? Can we turn the mirror on ourselves and say, do I delight in God's law? As I said, that we can get tripped up in this because of our own problems. The number of times that I have heard that, well, I just have trouble understanding the scripture. I have, it's just too far removed. I don't understand the context. I don't understand the words. I don't understand the meaning. My mom, back in the early 90s, was very, very much against technology. I remember when we finally got our first com uh, personal computer in 1998, I believe it was. It was a Gateway 2000 P5133. See, my mind fills with useless information, too. This thing has more computing power and memory than it did. And it's funny because she resisted it and she didn't want to deal with it. And over time, she learned bit by bit. And it's very, very funny now because my mother, when she travels, she can't go anywhere without her tablet. <laughs> Who are you and what did you do with Barbara Benson? <laughs> but bit by bit, she learned and she learned to use it and she learned to, to enjoy it and to have it there. She doesn't even use her laptop anymore. She bought a new one, and I said, Mom, why? Well, I might need to use it. Over time, over 20 years, and it's funny because we make those excuses, we make those reasons as to why we won't engage the Scriptures when over time we will learn to use and learn to love it. Is my mother perfect at technology? No. Is she, going to, is she going to go code an app? Heavens, I'm just happy when she remembers her passcode. But the analogy still stands that we may never be, we may never read Greek or Hebrew. I'll probably never read Aramaic or Syriac because there's always more to learn or Latin. But we can, over time, love and delight in God's Word. To delight in His law by constant use and by constant meditation. I love the Scripture more and more when I approach it. You know, I force myself to change series. It's a hard thing for me to do. I was explaining to Mike again that I'm one of those people that when it comes to food, I can, uh, we had peanut butter and jelly all last week. I'm going to go to the store today, Hy-Vee, and buy myself another jar of peanut butter and go home with my jelly. <laughs> and I'll be fine with it. But we, I force myself to change in terms of scripture so that we don't get into a rut. And I get nervous at times about switching series because I think, oh, this is a new workup. I'm not sure where everything goes in it. But every time I approach the Scripture, I delight in what God has for us, what God has for me in my own life. When I open the Bible and when I enter into the conversation with the saints who are still here and who have gone before me, it's a delight. Because there is always something there, and it's of an eternal value. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on he, his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf doesn't wither. Whatever he does prospers. 
Not so with the wicked. They're like the chaff the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. How well do you love God's word, God's law? How do you meditate on it? If we as a congregation do nothing more than to delight more and more into God's law, oh, oh, the blessing of God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Put within us that desire to know you more, to see your glory in the world, to see the work of your redemption, to delight in your word which shows your story for us. As we go through this summer together, Lord, seal this word in our hearts so that we may grow in faith and respond in the power of your Holy Spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.